to the Community Development Committee meeting for July 19. Uh, we'll start out with roll call. Ed Schachner. Present. Sean Anderson. Present. Dan Hansen. Present. Judy Octohoff. Here. And Scott Connor has an excused absence. He's not feeling well. Um, let's uh, talk about the minutes. Is there any objection to uh, or additions or comments about the minutes from last, last month? Seeing none, they'll stand approved. Um, we'll slide right into public comment. I'd like to call Ginny Drapp. Uh, if you're prepared. Hi, Ginny. We're going to keep her to two minutes tonight if you... Virginia. Good evening. My name is Virginia Draft, and I live in Emerald Township. I have copies of a link to a full-page article in the June 30th edition of the Country Today paper. I don't know how many of you get this paper, but it was pretty interesting. Uh, of course, it's about Kiwani County. Uh, Mark <clears throat> Borchardt has been part of the study along with other scientists that no noted regulations fall short of protecting the public. I've been going through the conditional use permit of Emerald Sky Dairy. The permit dated March 30th, 2001, states that the St. Croix County Land and Water Conservation Department and Zoning Office have the ability to make additional recommendations and conditions if unanticipated conditions arise that would affect the health and or safety of citizens or degrade the natural resources of St. Croix County conditions. Conditions will not be added without notice to applicant and they can request a hearing. Now I'm wondering, if the public can request a review of the permit to find out if or what and how the county will go about protecting health and safety as it is stated in the March 2001 permit. In recent studies out of Kiwani County um, have tied excessive manure applications to drinking water contamination causing illness to local citizens. Here in St. Croix County, we don't know how many folks have to buy bottled water to get through the week, or how many folks have been sickened by their well water. Just this past month, two people told me they only give their dogs bottled water. So keep up the good uh, water quality study going, and I thank you for the study, but be proactive and transparent. The state of Washington's appellate court just this month rejected the state's CAFO permits and found the state failed to protect water quality. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That was like one minute and 53 seconds. It was, <laughs> do you practice those? Okay. Uh, Brenda Salzing. This evening you have before you the resolution in support for upholding transparency in renewable energy development. The resolution calls for transparency in the way merchant developers approach our communities. When a community has no idea what is coming its way until the deal is done, there is no transparency, no local or county government involvement, and no public input. Currently there are about 60 renewable energy projects on the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, MISO, for short, MAP for Wisconsin. Besides the Highland Wind Project in the town of Forest, are you aware that there are three utility scale solar projects and one utility battery storage facility on the MISO map for St. Croix County? The projects are not named and the developers are unknown. That is not transparency for the county, the towns involved, or the residents. Merchant power plant developers do not have to prove need, efficiency, reliability, environmental impacts, costs, as utilities do. To make matters worse, 
investor-owned utilities such as XL Energy swoop in and skirt regulatory standards and purchase the projects. This is not transparency or responsible development of renewable energy. We have a lot of, uh, at stake here for St. Croix County. To make sure renewable energy does not destroy the fabric of our communities and the land stewardship with which we have all been blessed. Others in the state are looking to you, our county leaders, to take action to prompt legislative changes that will protect all of our property rights, private property rights, and the beauty of St. Croix County. This is how change happens, how laws that do not serve the public and blindfold transparency are changed. It begins with each of you, and I can guarantee that other counties and property owners in the state will applaud the initiative and will stand with St. Croix County on this resolution. If not us, who? If not now, when? Please vote to recommend the resolution to the County Board of Supervisors for their consideration for adoption. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, so now we're gonna have an introduction uh, Ellen, would you introduce Dennis to the committee? Uh, Dennis Merkel uh, started with us on March 31st, and he is our new park administrator for our park system. Dennis is just going to say a few words about himself, and uh, just wanted you all to know the name to the face. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And I um, just want to say I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I consider myself uh, from Nebraska via New Mexico, uh, where I spent most of the pandemic. Uh, I have a 97-year-old mother that lives down there, and she's still going strong. Um, so happy to be here. Thanks. Welcome aboard. Glad to, glad to meet you. Okay. Um, we have resolution in support for upholding transparency in renewal, renewable energy. Um, let's, uh, let's proceed forward. Um, we should start out with some kind of motion, I suppose. Or uh, how do you guys want to handle that? We don't have a staff report. We don't have anything other than the resolution that came down to us from the county board this doesn't or originate with our committee and we don't have any information other than what we have in the in the resolution so discussion i would rather have a discussion about it before we do any kind of and i mean i can understand the reasoning why it's an important thing but also some things came up at the board meeting, like Act 40 only covers certain areas. I think it either, I left my sheets at home, it either covers the wind farm or the solar or vice versa. I mean, it only covers one and it's, and I don't know how many people were involved in coming up with this and I would like to have a much better understanding before I would feel comfortable presenting it to the full board. I agree with Judy, and I think most of the uh, county board members, if I recall at the meeting, were act, uh, asking the same thing, that they, they needed more information. So um, as far as just trying to pass it as it stands, I guess I probably don't have enough information. So uh, I don't know how we proceed from there, whether we just postpone until we get more information. That's probably what I'm thinking. I can give an opinion if you're interested. Uh, this is a non-binding resolution which would go to state legislatures, legislators who are um, the same state legislators largely who wrote the state laws that took away our ability to, to uh, cite uh, uh, turbines, wind turbines and, and uh, and communication towers and non-metallic mines and so we would be sending a, a message to uh, an audience that has no interest in hearing the message we would be spending a great deal of money on staff time 
to do that, uh, which I'm just, I'm not willing to, to go through that exercise because we will all need to see the background. We'll all need to see the, the, um, the, the case law. We'd all need to see the history. We will go through the machinations of recreating state, the, the, the background and the due diligence of looking into state law for issues which have gone on in St. Croix County now for, what, a decade, uh, which will stir up and kick up a lot of dust that we have no jurisdiction over. This is something that doesn't belong in this committee. So I'm, I'd vote against whatever kicks in here. I'll make a motion to postpone indefinitely. I'll second it. Discussion? Discussion. Well, you're saying postpone, and I'm also hearing that you don't think it belongs in this committee. Well, where should it go if they want it to continue? Because it does have a val, it has valid reasoning behind it, but I don't, I, I just want a better understanding of how it came about. But is it this committee or is it another committee? I know we got sent it, but. It belongs in the state legislature, in my opinion. We have no jurisdiction over this. We were taken, the jurisdiction for this was taken away from us how long ago? Uh, many years ago. Uh, nine, uh, 2009. It was a long time ago. This this jurisdiction, uh, along along with uh, along with non-metallic mining and and communication towers, uh, we don't we don't have say over it. Um, we'd be sending a non-binding resolution saying, "Please, could you change the law to the state legislature?" And we will we will be kicking in a massive debate. I received six emails today from people who live outside of our county, long passionate emails asking us to change our uh, to change our uh, ordinances here in St. Croix County when they didn't understand that we don't have ordinances. We follow the state law. We have no control over the state law. And, and people who thought that we were in the process of changing ordinances in St. Croix County. How do these people in other, other counties got wind of the fact that we have this ordinance before us, I do not know. But it's just a harbinger of things to come. If we leave this on the table, we're going to create a debate that our staff doesn't have the time to deal with. And this, this is a prediction, but we would be doing it for very limited reasons, uh, ideological reasons. I don't think it's worth the time. I, I agree we lay it on the table to a date uncertain and leave it there. Let it die. We, it's not our business. It's the, state's, it's the state legislature's business because they chose to take it away from us. But this is not, this is just a resolution and support. It's letting them know that we don't like what they did and we'd like it changed. So this is not binding. But again, some of the things seem vague in it, and I don't like. I don't know who came up with it and when it was written, since it didn't. We haven't had a chance to study. I, you know, it's kind of to me. It's important because this is hopefully stopping. Who knows what's going to happen with solar farms or windmills or any other kind of renewable energy development. It's kind of like CAFOs, trying to nip it in the bud before it gets bad. And this is trying to get it so things are more open. But again, I don't know if the resolution is properly worded and who or what went into it. So even though the staff may have a limited amount of time, this is also one of their responsibilities. Um, I agree that there's this really um, whether people are supporting this resolution or not for people to be, have an educated vote on this it would take an inordinate amount of time and the staff has enough to do as it is um, I support the motion to table to day uncertain and with that I want to call a question all right uh, let's put it to a vote all in favor say aye aye, aye. And all opposed say the same sign. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, thank you very much.
let's move on. Uh, the next item is a resolution supporting the WDNR notice of decision grant application. And we'll call Tim Stever to the podium. Thank you. Um, do you have the presentation on there somewhere? Okay. <laughs> I don't have it memorized. Come on, Tim. Oh. That's it. Right there. I'll do Actually, the summary. Tim, this is just the yeah. 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 I'll do the presentation. No, I've, yet. I've got it now. Next. Thanks. So the resolution that was provided in your packet is basically related to a specific grant application that we'd like to prepare uh, within the division. We have a landowner that has a uh, failing manure waste facility, and it's already caused problems. Um, DNR sampling has documented that to be impacting a stream over in Glenwood area. And um, the, the landowners received a notice of decision uh, there as far as uh, that they've documented that there's a link between that spills that they've had and the, and the stream impacts. So the landowner is uh, willing to remove the facility and uh, is willing to do it with cost share. Um, this is a, we didn't want to utilize our normal state cost share that we have for other landowners because we already have a pretty good list of people that use up all our available funds. And so we would like to go for this NOD grant, it's called. And uh, it essentially ensures that we have a hand in getting this closed properly um, and that we can prevent that in the future because it's a, a failing system and it's very expensive to remove. And uh, I believe the grant would be close to, uh, close to $50,000 to provide that cost share. And uh, that's pretty much it. How long has this been going on? I mean, by the time we go through the grant process and get the grant and get started working on it, there's going to be nothing left in the storage unit. I mean, I, mm -hmm. when was this first discovered? This has a long history, but this is the first time it happened under my watch, and it'll be closed by the end of the fall. The reason this is happening is because I insisted that we sample the water as soon as spills happen. That forces, if you have a water quality impact, it forces the hand. And so when you have that, you can, DNR asks you, do you want to issue a notice of decision? If I feel it was a one-time accident, I would have said, no, I don't think we need to. We've already changed the practices or whatever. But if it's an ongoing issue, which this particular situation was, but there was never any samples taken, um, then I wanted to get this facility closed because to fix it, it's going to require more money. And it's, it's very poorly sited as far as a location um, from way back when. I don't think we had a hand in putting it in or anything like that. But it's just a facility that was utilized for as a dairy and uh, is very prone to leaking and running off because it's on top of a hill. And um, this is the first, it, there was a spill after that big rain that we had last June, I think it was. And then there was another one. I, I issued a letter and uh, we happened again and we got the samples that time. And uh, basically been working with the landowner on what they want to do. And it's kind of come to a head now and they've got the decision in their hand. And so they've got to close it now or they get fined. And this would just, this is special funds that we don't normally have access to. So I think it's a good thing to access those funds when we can, because I don't want to use our cost share for it. Because <laughs> those are generally for folks that are thinking a little more proactively. So. And it's worth adding that we don't have 50,000 in cost share. We don't get that much from the state. No. So we couldn't cost share. We don't want to use, if, yeah, if we get 45, $50,000 in cost yeah. share, we're not going to spend it on, well, I'm not saying we wouldn't, but it would be hard for me to do that when I have eight or ten other landowners that have medium small projects that have value, you know, 
that are willing to do stuff. So to get the most out of our money, we try to do the most effective small projects that we can. And the, a lot of the dairy things are very expensive. I think just to empty this is going to be close to $20,000. Any other questions? Uh, <clears throat> is this an ongoing, it's an operating dairy yeah. currently? Okay. Yeah. It's um, under, uh, under an agreement to remove the animals by such and such a date, so. Uh, next yeah. question, are we, are we guaranteed that we, that we'll get this money, or is it just, we're just applying I think, for it? I think we'll get it. It's application. We have to put in a sound application, but I believe we, we've shown ability to do that, yeah. They, they want us to, to resolve this situation, yeah. Pretty guaranteed. I'm, I'm not against this at all, but I'm just trying to get a better understanding of, I mean, is this affecting people's drinking water? Have we taken samples of that? Mm -hmm. I mean, and this has obviously been going on for more than a year. So what's being, I, this is being done for the farm. Mm -hmm. It has to be done, because otherwise it could get really horrendous. What is being done for the general public because of this? Mm -hmm. Or has anything been found to have a negative effect from this? Nothing negative that, other than those stream impacts that we've talked about, which I think have happened more times than we're, yeah. <laughs> and so there was a, a long history that everybody was nodding about how this has happened so many times, but when I went to the files, I couldn't find anything. So it got me pretty fired up, and I'm like, we've got to record this stuff, and started really pushing for that to improve, and it has. So this is one of the first ones to kind of come to a head. So, okay. what ha happens if they don't get the grant? Just I'm throwing a yeah. Um, I believe they are still under an order to resolve this issue, and um, you know they may have to sell land or property to do something like that. Yeah, they may sell too. I mean, I don't know what they had several properties, and we had issues on other ones. One of them, to their credit, they've already fixed all the problems on the other site. So, okay. Other questions? Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the resolution supporting the WDNR uh, notice of decision for the grant application. I'll second. Very good. It's been moved to second. It. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. Tim, I want to thank you for your work and, and congratulate you. This is excellent work that you've done in this. Yeah, thank you. Um, this next uh, presentation is uh, the next topic on the agenda is a nitrate source analysis project update. And uh, worked with this heavily on uh, with other staff on our team that are listed there. Uh, most notably Cole Webster, who's moved on, and we're working to replace his, uh, find somebody to do his work. Um, this particular work was, we have our trend baseline work that we're doing for the county that was one of the biggest priorities of the group, the groundwater study group that was formed. They wanted to know what's really going on as far as our groundwater. Is it getting much worse? What rate? You know, how is this a real... Uh, Bad problem as far as uh, in the immediate future, or is this just a longer term concern? So we have that network. The nitrate source analysis was an effort to describe the contribution of the nitrate to those samples that we're seeing. And so we worked uh, with, uh, to try to, uh, we set up a goal to try to classify the sources of nitrate and there's not that many ways to do that work. Um, one of the ways that was proposed to us from University of uh, Wisconsin Stevens Point was to use these what's called NSA samples. And what they do is they look at indicators um, that are highly related to a specific source. So we had uh, we ran these tests on set, on a set of samples that had 12 or wastewater or septic indicators, and I'll list those in a minute, and five agricultural indicators. They only had one that was a manure indicator, and that brings out a little problem towards the end there that I'll show you. 
these are the indicators that we looked at, just for your information, just if you want, we're really curious about it. Um, so basically there's indicators that are like an a artificial sweetener. Well, that's an indicator of a septic. And uh, some of the agricultural ones are herbicide breakdown products, for example. So that, that's the kind of testing that it is. Um, we started in, in 2019, and we got 14 of those done, looking at some of those TNC wells and town hall wells. And then we went back in 2020 and collected 39 more for a total of 53 samples that we did. It was fairly expensive sampling uh, work, and that was about the maximum that we could afford. Um, and we took the samples over to Stevens Point and had that done, and we did that. We finally got the analysis back this last spring and got all that statistical work done, and, and, and then we ended up here. Um, this is kind of a summary table of the detections. Um, about 79% of the samples had a detection for uh, pesticide degradation in it. And another pesticide, uh, alachlor, had 77% detection. And then it just kind of tapers down to where we did not detect certain things at all. And these are very sensitive tests down to the parts per billion. Um, so Cole did a lot of statistical analysis on this. And I'll show you a few graphs of what we found. But kind of a summary of the results is that there was a significant correlation between nitrate concentration and three of the five agricultural tracers. So kind of supported what we kind of thought, that it was from agriculture. Um, there was also a positive correlation between nitrate and the total number. of. So if you start adding all those together as, a, as one, you get a positive correlation. And there was also a correlation between nitrate concentrations in the wells that we, we took to sample and the land around it within a half mile or a one mile circle. We did both. It, it was very positively correlated to the amount of agricultural land that was within a half mile to a mile of the well that we were sampling. Um, and then there was a significant positive correlation between the total number of indicators and the percentage of agricultural land within a mile. So if you have agriculture, there's a good chance you're going to have detections of some of those that detections of some of those products that we measured. Um, what we didn't find was any positive correlation between wastewater septic and nitrate concentrations. Um, and, and a whole list of things that we tried to draw correlations with we did not find. Um, what we did find was a negative correlation, meaning if you had uh, detections for pouts in the water, um, we actually had lower levels of nitrate. So what that looks like, it's not so dramatic. Basically, um, if I can, so what this indicates is if you have a high level of, of uh, agricultural detections, those are your highest samples of nitrate. Lower detections of agriculture chemicals in those wells, you had low nitrate samples. And then reverse is true for septic. So if you had your, your highest nitrate um, samples that we found had the least amount of, of pouts detections in them. So and I know it's a lot of statistics, but I tried to I wanted to try to show it visually too. But basically, um, going back to this, this is really the most important thing was that it was very related to agriculture, not very related to pouts. Um, pouts are having their impacts on our wells, but they're not probably the cause of our nitrates. 
Um, the study suggests that agricultural activity is the predominant source of the nitrates that we've been measuring in our wells. And it also agrees with the work that was previously reported on from our citizens' groundwater monitoring. It had very similar results with our first two years of data that we're continuing to do. And it also agrees with the statewide studies that have been done that show about 90% of the nitrates from agricultural sources. Um, the septic indicators were very common. They're commonly found, but they didn't relate to nitrate. So it's important to, you know, remember those septics are having an impact, but they're not what's causing the nitrates. So then we kind of, we learned some things. One was that we could not differentiate in the water between the two main sources of nitrates that we generally think about, and that is fertilizer versus manure. Talk a lot about manure here, it seems, but our test did not, we only had one manure indicator in that list I showed, and we didn't find it in any of the 53 wells, which I didn't seem to think that was even possible. But it was not found, and I couldn't come up with a good reason. I don't believe it was widely used or some other reason that I couldn't really quantify, but we did not detect it at all. Um, the other four agricultural source indicators were not directly related to fertilizer, they were related to pesticides, so they were put on crops. So they're not necessarily exclusive to either commercial fertilizer or manure, you could have had manure on those fields uh, too. So the study only went so far, it didn't do a very good job of telling us if manure was the problem um, for a lot of our nitrate wells. And I know that that's a question that we think about a lot and we get questions on from citizens. So one of the things that we can do as we research this was there is testing that could differentiate between fertilizer and manure. Um, we dug into it quite a bit and it was very expensive, but then we realized that we had an opportunity in front of us because we have 17 samples that we've identified in our network that do not have any septic in them at all. We could go to those wells as a source of tests, and if we ran samples on those tests, it would be about $3,200 might need a little bit of sampling equipment, but for less than 4,000, we could probably sample 17 samples. And what that would tell us is what is the most likely source of nitrate in those wells, manure or fertilizer. The reason I believe that's important is because we've often talk about should we do some more with regard to regulation or ordinance for manure, and I have yet to prove that we have a problem with manure in groundwater, which is frustrating because I think that there is, but I have to go with the data and what I have been able to measure. Um, so I believe that this overall groundwater project has kind of come to a spot where we should support this additional sampling next year. We've kind of got it to a point where we've identified some samples that are agricultural wells that are the primary impacts or the only impacts we've been able to measure are agriculture and we could do this testing to determine the manure and fertilizer balance and that might guide us down the road with regard to um, where, where we want to put our our work our, whether that's education or whether that's regulation so that's kind of where I'm at I guess I don't have any questions, but I guess I, I think I fully support the spending the 3,200 being where we're right at that point where you could, mm -hmm. if determined, uh, I think we need to find that out. So you test for caffeine. We did. And what does that show? All it does is it, it shows that, 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 that there's an impact on that well from a septic system. Yeah. 
That's a, it's a, one of those then that you would say, yeah, it supports that this is being impacted from a septic. If you found caffeine, what would that show? Oh, it would just show that it's the water from the septic system is getting into that particular well sample. Which is not That's supposed to. That's all. Right. I get it. It's a, yeah, this type of testing is not as, uh, it's kind of more of a elimination, process of, of elimination. Because yeah, no. cows, cows don't drink coffee. No, but they drink antibiotic, apparently. Right, right. A bit of it. And right. we didn't find it, but I think they might have already moved on from that particular product. I don't know. They're selling too much organic beef, I guess. Maybe. Or you went, went organic way a long time ago or something. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I, how do, we, do you just want a thumbs up from the committee on the 3200 bucks? That sounds like an operational decision. It is an operational decision. It might have to wait till 2022, just because of where our budget's at. Mm -hmm. It also just, you know, one one issue that we will face if you decide to do anything with this data, or even if we had the $3,200 additional data, is it was a very small sample, 50 some wells, mm -hmm. which is why I had suggested at the Committee of the Whole about future budgets, and requested 30 to $50,000 or an ongoing fixed amount for this, for all this work we want to do, because that will be, you know, they'll shoot holes in it. You won't get very far if you want to do something. If you don't want to do anything, then that's different. But um, that's a very small sample. We have about 40,000 households, not about half of them. Let's just roughly say 20 to 25,000 wells in St. Croix County, rural wells. So you've got a lot of things that, 50 wells out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would remind the committee, the county board, the public that the ground and surface water study came about as a compromise to avoid a moratorium on CAFO permits that the county board had and still has the authority to issue. We need to continue to put resources into improving ground and surface water quality because at some point, if those, if those efforts aren't made, a county board in the future may decide to take the draconian measure of halting per the permitting process, uh, which, is, which is going to be, would be very difficult uh, for everybody in the agricultural community and cause a, a lot of problems, a huge amount of problems with uh, the confidence that the agricultural community has in the government. And I would do anything I could to avoid that through positive measures, which this is. So I prefer to see this process continue through adequate funding and adequate work. And Tim Steber is as good a professional as we could possibly hope to find. And I'd like to continue to fund his work. Thanks, That's man. my two cents worth. Uh, Moving on, let's talk about Eckert Bluff lands and invite John up to the podium. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. The purpose of your next agenda item is to provide the committee an update on where we're at. Um, in terms of the Eckert Bufflands Master Park Plan. So a little bit of background in terms of the location. Um, the 170 acre park is located in two different townships. Uh, the northern two thirds is located in the town of St. Joseph and the southern third um, in the town of Hudson adjacent to the St. Croix River. You see downtown Stillwater on the upper left of your screen, North Hudson, in Hudson and I-94 at the bottom of your screen. And then Willow River State Park um, in fairly close proximity to the east. A Little bit of details about the parkland itself. Uh, the park is comprised of three different acquisitions that the county took part in. Uh, in 2015, uh, the Richards property was purchased. That was 54 of the acres. Next was the Eckert parcel in 2018, which was, which was approximately 114 acres. And then the last one happening recently, the Zappa parcel, which was a, a two acre piece at the southern portion of the park. Um, in total, there's approximately a 2,800 feet of shoreline along the St. 
Croix Scenic Riverway. Some of the unique features of the property um, includes 3,000 feet of bluff line, old growth woods, habitat for migratory waterfowl, wildfowl, and uh, songbirds, ravine systems, um, spectacular views of the St. Croix River. Um, from the top of the bluff to the ordinary high water mark of the St. Croix River, there's about 190 foot elevation difference. So really some spectacular views. Also some older agricultural fields that will be restored back to a prairie landscape, um, unique native plant communities, and of course the existing cabin constructed by the Eckert family in 1970. So the initial intent was to begin this process first thing in 2020. Um, the county contracted with HKGI, which is a park planning consulting firm. Uh, the county entered into the contract uh, with HKGI I believe it was in January in 2020. We were just getting the project started and then of course everybody was sent home because of COVID. So initially some of our outreach methods were to include workshops, pop-up meetings at events, um, outdoor locations, open houses and stakeholder meetings. Of course with the social distancing and limits on what we could do, we really needed to rethink our public outreach strategy. So we kind of reconvened, we reassessed our situation, and instead what we did is kind of a multifaceted approach. Um, of course, we went to the more traditional fashion of using all of the county newspapers and putting together snippets of the project itself and putting together a link to what would be a website and project webpage. We really utilized St. Croix County Park's Facebook page. And then what we did is we took um, a three-quarter mile radius of the park property itself and we mailed individual notices to landowners indicating the project, a link to the website, and a link to an initial questionnaire of what people thought about the different um, efforts we were going to undertake. So that totaled 600 letters. We also, um, you know, sent outreach to all of our county board members. Every gover government jurisdiction in St. Croix County, all of our villages, our cities, our towns, our partners at the DOT, DNR, also the St. Croix River Association. We have numerous local bicycle and bird clubs. We also have a prairie enthusiast group that we contacted, as well as the St. Croix County Sportsman's Alliance. So I think what we did is we, we regrouped. Instead of waiting for the public processes in person, we really took the proactive approach of contacting people by mailing or by email. I covered what's on the left-hand matrix, but on the right-hand matrix, we also had limited meetings. So we, um, later on in the COVID process, um, this would have been about, um, I think last summer, last fall, in August, we engaged what we called stakeholder meetings. We invited natural resource groups such as the Alliance, the DNR to have in-person meetings or to comment via email. Um, you'll see in some of the maps here in just a moment that XL Energy has a, a major utility easement through the property. We had a stakeholder meeting with our um, utilities and our local government officials. I believe the Saint, town of St. Joseph attended and we were able to communicate with the town of Hudson a little bit later on. Um, we also invited adjacent landowners um, to the park to a stakeholder meeting. In total, that included 28 landowners. So we set up two different meetings with 14 groups separately. And from that, we had six people attend. However, we did receive comments by email for those who chose not to attend um, because of COVID. And on the online survey that we put together, um, we asked some general questions about the property itself. We put together some items in terms of potential park uses. Um, we put that on SurveyMonkey and we received 647 responses um, from the survey that was open from late June until early September. We also had online interactive mapping that 35 people utilized as well. And then from the summary of input um, from the 650 or so responses, we were able to determine some of the higher priority uses that people desired. And as you can see, I won't go through everything, but the higher interest items were hiking trails, scenic vistas and overlooks, as well as picnic areas. 
And what's interesting, if you look at the blue box on the right, um, of the 647 responses, uh, we had 471 responses that first day the survey was launched. So from our Facebook blitzing and um, from the individual mailers, we had what I would think a significant amount of people engaged in the process early on. That survey was open for 10 weeks with a total of eight survey questions. The other thing I'd like to point out too is that from our Facebook numbers, I was quite astonished from the numbers we had people that were referencing Facebook. Um, so in the phase one engagement, um, the Facebook reached almost 33,000 people. Um, of those 33,000 hits, 8,100 people engaged in the link. So they actually opened up the page to look at what was going on. Um, and then in the, uh, we did a second post about two weeks later. Um, again, we had 8,000 people reached with 486 engagements. So during the course of the survey, we blitzed out about three different times for people to get engaged. And again, the numbers that we'll summarize in the draft plan were, were quite significant. So from the first gauge, from the first engagement, we put together um, three different concept plans. Um, we put together um, uh, three different concepts for review, but we needed to make sure that in the, in the right hand side of your screen in the gray box, um, because a portion of the property which was purchased with DNR stewardship funds, um, there are program elements that have to be required within the park itself. Those being hiking, cross country skiing, fishing, bow and rifle hunting, along with trapping. So as part of our concepts, we needed to make sure that those uses were gonna be part of the ultimate park. From the feedback, we put together three concept plans. I'm not gonna get into detail on those, but the concept on your left um, featured more of the camping options. The middle um, concept plan included the most adventure recreation options. And then concept three had the most hiking options. And we asked people in the second round of survey to rate those, make comments, do you have a preference of one option or the other or a combination? And so as part of that outreach, again, we contacted all the people we did in the first phase. We used our local media outlets. The other advantage we, we used was that from our phase one um, survey engagement, we asked people to leave us their emails if they wanted a direct contact once we came out with our second public engagement forum. And we had almost 300 emails from people that were interested in continuing to get the updates and future surveys. So again, I, I think that um, shows well as far as the outreach effort. As part of phase two, we put together a story map. Hopefully as, as committee members, you had a chance to look at that, but that story map opened a page or a link that really introduced you to the various components of the concepts in detail. It talked about the natural resource inventory, and then of course, some of the challenges we had with some of the overgrowth and invasive species. As a result of those responses that concluded in February of this year, um, we got some comments. We had 142 total responses, responses. The survey was open for six weeks with eight survey questions. And as you can see, the different concepts and the different levels of interest, concept one, again, was the, uh, the camping option. Concept two was the adventure, more activity option. And concept three was the, the hiking trail option. And then of course the red bar would be people preferring a mix of the concepts. And people really like the idea of the different components of the different concepts. Almost one third of the people supported um, using a mix of the concepts. So once we got that information, staff went to work and we spent a number of months with our planning consultant trying to put together a master plan that would best reflect the comments we received and the best of the three concepts that we push forward. So next I'm gonna get into a little bit more of the detail of the preferred concept. And I put together, uh, or we put together a map that I placed in front of your um, seat tonight, which is a, an 11 by 17 master plan. I'm gonna talk about it in sections, but please refer to your map if the detail doesn't show up well on the screen for you. 
One of the things we learned early on about using the Eckert Blufflands property was the access. And if you want to follow the cursor on the screen, um, right now to access the property, you have to utilize Old Highway 35, which kind of runs in alignment like this. And the access points onto 35 are, are very difficult to navigate. Um, they access the new Highway 35 at very difficult angles in which to gauge oncoming traffic. So as part of our planning process, we really needed to identify a new access. And that new access point was identified at the northern portion of the parcel at this location here. The main road would then go into the site, utilizing the existing River Heights Trail Road, and then go back into the site. Part of this would necessitate working with the town of St. Joseph on vacating the existing 35 in this location here. That would allow us to utilize existing right away and not have to worry about crossover access. And then the old 35 would be cul de sac at this point. And then old 35 would only be used to access these five households. So again, none of the park access would be going by these people's homes. As part of the internal road network, we would identify an 18 foot wide bituminous road with two foot gravel shoulders. And of course we consulted with um, our highway department on um, widths and, uh, and things like that that would um, provide the safety needed for two way traffic. This is a little bit more of a detail of the road access. You'll just have to flip yourself. So the top of the map is now east Again, this is the north-south existing Highway 35. And this just shows a little bit more detail of the challenging grade, a little bit more detail of where the cul-de-sac would be on old 35. It also shows some of the trail locations as we continue to work on our trail projects in this area and how the trail could access the park. And then of course we consulted with DOT and our highway commissioner on adequate bypass lanes, turning lanes. So we have spent a fair amount of time on this to make sure that we have an adequate um, access for future park development. And again, this access would come in perpendicular to Highway 35 with good visual um, sight distances that people can see oncoming traffic. Not if the access were here and people would really have a hard time um, negotiating the turning movements. So getting into the draft, um, we're gonna talk about the park in three different areas, the north, central, and south. Just some of the pictures here showing some of the lodging elements. We have, we're proposing camper cabins, yurts, as well as hike-in campsites. Some of the more adventure recreational activities would include a, an active playground, rock climbing, ropes course, a smaller mountain bike course. And then some of the other recreational opportunities would include sledding hills, stargazing mounds, hiking, and uh, prairie restoration. So we'll start with the northern area. And if you want to follow on your map, that would be at the, the point northerly tip of um, the property. Most of this area would be natural surface trails. We are proposing a picnic shelter in the center location of this area. There would be 13 proposed camping sites in these areas. Um, we do have a upland wetland here that we have to work around. Uh, you'll see the darker shade of the property that represents uh, a major ravine system. And then of course, I was telling you earlier about the 190 foot um, elevation difference from the St. Croix River to the top of the bluffs, which this plan is respecting. So as you can see, this is more of the passive hike-in camping area. You see the alignment of the trails in this location. As we move to the central part of the park, this becomes more of our active area. John, we have a question. Oh, yes. I just, you have potable or vault toilets in the middle in the south sections, but nothing 
in the north section. Is that a lapse? I mean, if you have a picnic shelter and campsites, you need some kind of toilet. That's a good call. I believe we had one in here. I, I guess um, <laughs> it must have gotten taken out inadvertently. It'd be a good thing to get put back in. Yes. Actually, John, if you recall, what we planned is that there's not very good access up there to put in porta potties and service them on a an regular basis. And there is provision in Wisconsin statute to have the kind of camp in site, hike in sites, where people would, this is, truly would be rough camping. It would be an opportunity for people to do a different kind of camping up there, tent only, that kind of thing. And so unless the property to the west, east, excuse me, east, the farmland, would become developed, this we would ask for a variance and not have restrooms up there. People would be able to have their own, um, the, the term is escaping me, but kind of like they do in the boundary waters. And we would only be able to do that if there was exception from the state. And then there is a certain distance. We also know, John, if you were, if you can see it on your map, um, there is a main parking area, kind of where the Excel Energy Transmission Line moves. John, if you could go back to a larger picture there. So as you can see where the XL energy line, and that would be a main area, and that area would have restrooms in it. And from there, those could service these hike-in campsites. I mean, that, that is what we have to do because there's no way to service it on an ongoing basis until and if something happened with the property to the east, and then we could have it in that John, if you can point to that low, he is pointing to that low area, a very flat area that we could have some facilities in. So that's the initial plan. That is correct. We did take it out not mm -hmm. knowing the timing of when or if the abutting property would develop. Yes, that's correct. But, uh, I mean, the way I'm hearing this is that would be like a known advantage for, you know, certain people enjoy doing that kind of thing so i think it'd be a good option to have we've uh, worked with our consultants and have already researched what it would take to get a variance even a temporary variance so that we did not have to have restrooms up there of some kind again we're going back to if you don't have some kind of access where you can get out there and service porta potties you can't bother to put them out there. So um, this would be very rough camping, that the kind that some people have expressed a lot of interest in seeing available. So. I think when we have the final master plan draft, there'll be about a 45-page document that accompanies the master plan, but I do think we talk about that in the narrative about if and when the property to the east develops, that that bathrooms will be looked at at that time. Um, so yes, I was at the center part of the park and again, the access point, the main access point at this location. So the central area would contain the entry station, um, which would be in somewhat from the actual park entrance. Once at the entry station, you would take a right and go to the central activity area, which if you look on your plan, we kind of highlight in the white box, some of those activities. We'd have a parking lot that would not only house the people that would be located in the central activity area, but as Ellen mentioned, those who want to park to access the hike-in sites, this is where they would park. We'd have flush, rest, flush restrooms and water, four different picnic shelters, a picnic area, um, a themed playground, adventure nature play, trailhead, paved loop trails, and also a number of overlooks. Um, one overlook here and then two just to the north of the property as well as stairs down to the shoreline. And then once you get down to the shoreline, there would be wading areas. We would not be promoting these areas as a swimming area. They would simply be for wading. You would try to mark it so that people really couldn't go in much more than, you know, five, four to five feet, more like four. It's just too, we don't have the interest in trying to have 
um, lifeguards. It's quite a steep drop off on this side. So there's a current. There's a very strong current on the St. Croix. So we'd be focusing on making this access to the water because people will go in it whether we want them to or not. And so we're trying to promote positive, safe use. And then, of course, here are the more active play areas, the adventure play climbing area with rocks, potential different um, rock climbing features, the low ropes and potentially higher ropes courses. We do have a, a smaller area for a mountain bike course, which we received a, a number of comments on. And then, of course, in this general area in the middle would be the uh, Oak Savannah Prairie restoration. And then in keeping with trying to respect the, uh, the four inholdings or the four private property owners that you see in this area, um, establishing signage, private property, um, as well as some existing vegetation, as well as planting new vegetation as well. In this location at the southeast portion, we have the proposed sledding hill, which would share a parking lot at this location with the mountain bike course and people who just may want to park here to begin their, their hikes. And we should mention, because we, we feel it's an important point, is this mountain bike course would be an educational course for, and fairly flat. It's would not, the park would not have mountain biking in it. This would be to, for educational purposes, for people to learn how to handle true mountain biking. Because we do not want to deface or, de or cause any damage to the ravine structures on the property. And then you see the silver line that kind of follows the uh, northerly edge of the central area. This would be a bike or walk-in access from the trail off of Highway 35 that will ultimately end up at the loop trail. As the committee may remember, we did get a grant and we are in the design process for the Highway 35 trail from North Hudson to the Eckert Bluffland Parks. Uh, this fall, there will be another round of uh, TAP grant um, application processes and the county will be actively pursuing the phase two of the Highway 35 trail project. And then as we get to the South Blufflands area, this area is really more dedicated to some of the more, um, uh, I would say formal camping. We get into some of our camper cabin uses, um, also some of our yurt uses, as well as some uh, interesting trails that I'll highlight here. So the existing Ecker cabin is in this location, kind of at the top of the bluff along the St. Croix River. And then you'll see a series of yurts. We have seven yurts that are proposed along one of the internal roads in this location. And then we have a series of camper cabins in primarily uh, three different locations. We have a number of them at the Ecker cabin location. We have some camper cabins just south of the main access road. Two of the camper cabins are proposed to be ADA accessible. We also have a third parking facility at this location, as well as a second stargazing mounds um, just south of this area. We have a very pronounced ravine system area in the very southeast corner of this property. Um, working with our consultants, we thought that would be a great um, hiking trail that would utilize a, a number of swinging bridges in different locations to really provide a unique um, hiking experience. And then, of course, we talk about signing the boundary of the park. We had a lot of, well, we had a fair number of comments from abutting property owners about um, making sure that the county is proactive in identifying the property as park use and establishing the perimeter with no trespassing beyond or something like that. The other component that the committee should be aware of is that the internal park road uh, will also serve two residences. We have one existing residence at this location, and then we uh, have a, a second residence that has, yet, that has yet to be built at this location. So those will be issues that we'll be working with with existing property owners. And again, you see some examples of the uh, swinging bridge pictures and um, over on the right-hand side of your screen. This next slide just summarizes the features that will be in the park 
Um, interestingly, if you look at the left hand blue box, 1.2 miles of paved road, um, 1.56 miles of paved trails, and 3.65 miles of natural surface trails, whether they're wood chip or crusher finds, things that are non-paved. Summary of the camping opportunities, three hike-in campsites proposed, a total of 17 camper cabins and seven yurts. And then you see the activities under the recreation area that I covered. And again, want to emphasize that hunting um, would be part of the park usage. And then finally, there will be other elements that um, are, we're really still working on that I haven't summarized in the PowerPoint, but there'll also be sections in the plan that deal with natural resource pres preservation, invasive species management. We have a tremendous amount of buckthorn, black locust, um, garlic mustard that are really um, concentrated in some areas. So we're going to have a, a plan to kind of get control of that. We'll also be putting together a phasing plan for construction of improvements. And then we'll be putting together a cost estimate for those improvements. And then our next step would really be trying to establish when we would think a public hearing would be required. Um, what we're thinking at this point in time is that um, we want to add the Eckert Bluffland Park Master Plan to our outdoor recreation plan. Amending that plan would require a public hearing. Plus, I think we would want to have a public hearing anyway for the master plan itself. So at this point, we're probably looking at um, September for a potential hearing date. Again, that's tentative. Everything that you're looking at here, I want to emphasize, was stamped with draft. It's still somewhat of a work in progress, but again, we just wanted to give the committee a flavor of what's been worked on and what's kind of transpired to date. So I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have or comments, suggestions. Um, my, I guess one of my concerns is if there's hunting slash trapping, how are you going to protect the safety of the people that are hiking through there? I mean, bullets go pretty, they can travel half mile, mile, and they shoot and they miss and someone's hiking. How is that being handled? Okay. I don't mean to be pessimistic, but realistic. Well, we have a system in place at Glen Hills. I mean, I know Glen Hills have some part of the park open to hunting with hiking trails. So we did get a lot of quick people with a lot of those same questions and a lot of concerns. But honestly, Willow River State Park has a, allows hunting and trapping right now and always and has for many, many years. And what they focus on is educating people about the deer hunting season because that's the most, um, possibly might say the most fraught with possible problems. And they said they really, most of the trappers would go, would use the trails to get to where they might trap, but they don't put traps on trails. They put them off into right. the woods. Yeah. And um, people would be, have, you know, the rules, the suggestions would be stay on the trails. That's why we have the trails. Uh, don't try to go off tramping through the woods. And you can't stay on the trails in the northern part, though, at certain times when your body has bodily functions that it has to take care of. So they well, are going off. So They might, but <laughs> I would say if you're going hiking to the north, you should plan that there would be signs that would say, this is a so many mile hike or so many, it's not many miles because the whole park has only got about, whatever it was, three, five miles of hiking. And so if you go for a hike to the north, you need to, A, these are not going to be easy hikes. These are for the most fit people. Um, B, you need to plan that there just are no restrooms. So don't hike up, hike back, hold it. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't expect otherwise to some extent, but you also, they don't have to go very far off. And we could certainly encourage um, trappers to go a certain minimum distance, more than 10 feet off the trail for instance. And I would just like to add quick, Dan, that um, yes, we understand that there could be some conflicts, but we also understand that Willow River State Park has made it work. Glen Hills County Park has made it work. Um, we would prefer to have exactly the same rules as are in the um, 
at Willow River State Park. All the state parks were given a set of guidelines a few years back. The Natural Resources Board that makes those decisions um, has changed since then, and it, we were advised by DNR that at this time, do not come in and ask for some reduced hunting. It'll never go to zero, but they said do not ask for it. But there may be that opportunity and once we have this master plan done, once we explain the concerns, we also know that numerous citizens in that area who expressed their comments and came in and met with us specifically about hunting are very prepared to help us go to the Natural Resources Board and say this is the kind of hunting that we are willing, that we want to see happen and to push real hard for, very similar to Willow River State Park. The other thing I'd like to point out too is that the DNR stewardship money was used to purchase the Ecker property, which is everything south of this line. Uh, the 53 acre Richards property, from my understanding, was not purchased using DNR funds and is not subject to required hunting. So, I mean, there's some, like Ellen mentioned, mapping and educating. That's going to be another important part to make sure that, you know, as a county, we would not have to allow hunting in this area. That would be a policy decision later on from the county board, but at least that's uh, an option the county would have. As and far we, as we also do not have to allow hunting on the two acres that we purchased from Mr. Zappa down in the south. That had no stewardship money either. Right down here. Yep. So we, it's an odd suggestion, but that provides us with a nice buffer to some of those property owners. Also, there are a lot of um, orange circles on the prop on the map you'll see them the, anything or not anything but certain items are considered um, residential or related to residential use like picnic shelters so everywhere you see an orange circle hunting is not allowed because it has to be a certain distance back from those residential uses 300 feet mm -hmm. so we have things that we can work with and discuss with the Natural Resources Board at the appropriate time when we think we're most ready to uh, influence some change. And um, we think we have arguments that would work to reduce um, hunting to a reasonable, manageable amount, hunting and trapping, without preventing it completely. We do not think that's appropriate. Um, we think it's appropriate to compromise and find good compromises. One more, and this, I'm just throwing this out. This is just an extra. Um, I assume dogs have to stay on leashes. And I'm wondering what the possibility would be to get a smaller dog area in here for people that want to let their dogs, I mean, if they're camping there for a week, the dog needs to run. So I'm just throwing that out as an extra. I don't know how feasible that would be, but it's there. Well, all of our existing parks still do allow dogs but own, and other pets, but only on leashes. And Glen Hills Campground, which does allows dogs, they must remain on leashes. So I would say at this point, we'd be continuing the same policy. Oh, but if there weren't firsts, there wouldn't be anything. Well, it's worked very well at Glen Hills for a very long time, so it's hard to... And they're not allowed anywhere in the water. We don't allow dogs to jump into the water. If you hear about it at Homestead, it's people who are jumping at the boat landing, not in our park. Are we going to allow hunting for those situations where there's open season, like coyotes? Or is, will there be, or are we going to restrict year-round hunting? Right now, we don't have the authority to restrict any kind of hunting. So we have to go to the Natural Resources Board and ask for specific restrictions and try to get it passed. So there's, um, there's that. There could be people shooting 24 hours a day if they are coyote hunters. Well, they'd still have to stay outside all of the orange circles. Sure, I get that. I'm yeah. just, um, and I, and I hunt. I've hunted in Willow River Park. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down to Kinney Connect because, God forbid, I shoot something on that kind of terrain where I have to climb down a hill to get a deer. Um, that would be more than I want to do. But um, 
this is going to be some miserable terrain, just like Will, uh, Kenny Kinnick. If, if somebody were to shoot a deer and then have to go down that terrain, it's there, we're going to have to get some athletic deer hunters in here. If, uh, if somebody really wants to hunt this, they're going to have to be serious. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Well, in Willow River State Park, they have a restricted area, though, don't they? Mm-hmm. Um, are we thinking about having restricted areas uh, where they don't allow hikers during the deer hunting season? That would be one approach. We haven't written anything out or done anything at this point. We are waiting to see what master plan gets adopted. So it'd be a next step kind of project. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> On the, those private property owners, there's four houses and possibly two more. Um, they have to enter th- past the entry station. Is that going to be a problem, like if it's traffic's backed up and they want to get in to their houses? Because the road's only 18 feet wide and you've got to have two lanes of traffic. Could they be stuck trying to get into their own house? As we get to more detailed design of the entry station and entrance road, we will make accommodations for that. Um, River River Heights Trail is an easement that you know provides access to the in-holding properties in this location, and as a county, we'll be obligated to make sure that they are able to maintain safe and consistent access. I look forward to seeing how it all plays out. This is very exciting and, and excellent. I think it's an excellent plan. Sean, do you have any thoughts? Um, I think it's pretty well laid out. I don't really have any questions that haven't been asked already. Thanks for your time and excellent work. And uh, it's always good to hear from you, John. Thank you. All right, next up is our administrator with the financial report. I have walked uh, every inch of that park. So I've been up and down every ravine out there. And, and there wasn't a porta potty. Uh, so, anyways, <laughs> uh, when cool. we look at the, uh, the budget, this is through June. Uh, the only thing that I was really going to point out was uh, two pieces. One is on parks revenues. Um, so if you compare where we are, we're at 156,000 compared to 210,000 at the same time last year. So park revenues are down. Last year was an anomaly year though, where we recorded almost double our normal uh, park revenues uh, as travel restrictions kept everyone local. We will still hit though uh, the budget projections. I think we're still on target to hit our budget projections. We didn't raise those way up uh, to an area where we couldn't hit them still. Um, but it is uh, of note uh, that things are returning to normal, uh, which means a little bit less park visiting also. Um, and just the opposite of that then is when we look at the zoning department and we look at uh, to it. Yeah, the uh, zoning permits and fees. Um, so last year at this time we were at 84,000. We're up to 110,000 now. So. People aren't going to parks, they're building stuff, I guess. So <laughs> um, so you can just see a, a change. So those are some changes from the prior year to the current year. Otherwise, everything else was looking good in the budgets. I didn't have any other red flags. Uh, I would be um, happy to entertain any questions that uh, Supervisor Ochterhoff may have. I don't have any. OK, very good. All right, thank you very much. Moving into the, the discussion of the capital improvement plan, and this would be you and Ellen. So I'll give you a description of what we're looking at um, on the capital improvement plan. So the different colors and the meanings that they have. So the blue numbers are, um, they were, the project was on the plan before, but we've changed those dollar amounts. So the blue number is indicating that we've updated the dollar amount. A lot of times those are increases, sometimes it's a decrease, but as a project gets closer or new inflationary factors play into it, we change the dollar amounts. So we wanna indicate to you where we've changed a dollar amount from the prior year plan. The red, that means it's brand new to the plan. This was not on the plan last year. 
Um, so these numbers were added in. And then anything that's in black, that was exactly the same way it showed up on the plan last year. So we want to look at um, areas then that we highlighted. So I gave you the entire KIP here, um, but the um, departments and the projects that fall under the community development jurisdiction are in parks. Um, so we have uh, our annual routine park maintenance. That's the same as the prior year. We've updated um, the dollar amount on some of these other projects, and we've also moved them up uh, to the first year of the project. Um, I've also noted, if you see at the end of this, you can see a little ARPA in purple at the end. That's to denote that we've added it on the list of requests for ARPA funding. Um, that doesn't mean that it will be funded uh, through that funding source, but we've requested it that way. And that's why we also moved some of these up to the first year. Um, if they are going to be approved by the county board to be funded through ARPA, then we want to get started on them because these projects have to be done by 2024. So I know that first camper cabin took uh, community development a little while to get done. So if we're going to build a bunch of them, we need to get going on it. Um, so that's most of the projects. I think the only new project that was on there uh, that hasn't been on this list before was the 22 site RV campground. It had been on a prior year kit, but it was not on last year's kit. Um, that's why it's denoted in red. And this was another um, ARPA funded request. So are there any questions about these specific projects? And you know, probably my biggest question for Ellen and, and for this committee is, okay, if they're not gonna be ARPA funded um, and we have to refigure out where these projects are gonna fall, which is the most important one to you? Where should the priority be? No, I want the committee to answer it, but. <laughs> hey buddy, what's your favorite? Well, you need to keep up the maintenance. That's, you know, because if you don't keep up the maintenance, people aren't going to come. So that's, you know, and then. That's the basic. Yeah, that's the basic. And then it's, I would, you know, build more places for people to camp because they came. So you want, even though it might have a little decline, you want to keep them coming and you want to give them what they want. Like the yurts are going to bring in people, even though that might not be on here. And building the camper cabins, there's such a waiting list, it makes sense to have them. Well, I've got uh, a few questions. Um, a lot of these changes are almost or almost 100% increase in prices. What is the, ma is the, just the cost of materials the major driving factor? I can explain that if you like. Okay. So in the past, for instance, um, some of these we looked at them and tried to imagine phasing them more. For instance, the camper cabins were broken to two phases. And Ken has asked us to revise to some extent how we submit requests. And he asked us to put in the full costs, including things like um, the design costs, which some, we had broken it usually like design would be one phase getting it to um, construction documents for bidding, and then there'd be a phase one and a phase two after that. Um, so that's one element. Another element is, yeah, I did reach out and asked about the incredible costs of um, the construction materials and labor has gone up, and we did build in um, some significant increases due to what we were told. Also, we adjusted these because um, we basically had some of these go back to the last time we updated the KIP or the, mass, the outdoor rec plan, excuse me, and some of them were getting to be three and four years old. So we adjusted for that and things just jumped with all those adjustments. And I was only using um, about 5%. I've heard that construction costs have gone up about 10%, but I only put in a 5% increase for actual construction. But then we also did previous year adjustments and combined things. So that's where most of it is. There's also, I, I would just point out to you that the, one of the items, um, 
the third project from the top, New Glen Hills Group Camping Area, we do already have a $250,000 grant from Wisconsin DNR towards that project and we're already paying for out of existing budget the um, construct um, getting to the bid phase so we can get bids this fall and see you know what a hard number would be but that amount in there does include adjacent to that is that other project at the bottom the one that the that actually like Ken said it was in previous projects but um, actually was so far down on the list that it shouldn't show up very well <laughs> anyway um, that is right adjacent to it when the group camp is moved then the RV camp would be in the old group camp site so that one there would be some basically I rolled some of the um, support features if we got good pricing we could or if we were doing something some of those support features are actually in that first project that would then actually reduce that last project. But if the prices were too high, they'd be bumped back. So that's a, there's a little double counting in there. Does that answer it? May I answer that question? Yeah. Yes, next. <laughs> um, I asked my second question. I, I know we heard this before, but um, ARPA, if I'm remembering correctly, will cover a percentage of the cost of a project and I, if you feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but it's up to a certain amount per either per project or per county. Um, do you have those numbers specifically? Yeah, so St. Croix County has been allocated $17.5 million um, that we have um, a range of uses for. There are restrictions on what those can be used for. Um, these types of projects, um, it's a little bit tricky because uh, there's very narrow range that uh, these types of projects can fall into. Uh, Corporation Council and I have discussed that quite a bit today. Um, so it's possible uh, that these could be funded, but it's really up to that dollar amount. The county board is going to be asked uh, next week, Wednesday, to start talking about how to use that $17.5 million. And there is a whole list of um, uses, I mean, outside of uh, these capital projects. Um, HHS has a dozen items on that list of how they would use it. So there's a lot of different uses for it. All right. So if we, I guess just hypothetically, if the plan isn't to use it for this, some of these projects might get pushed a year or three or two or whatever. Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. yeah so absolutely. So if these are not going to be ARPA funded, they are not going to stay in that first year. Most, if not all of them, will be pushed back into uh, years further out. Because yep. the county can only afford so much for capital projects each year. So it's about prioritization. Um, so we will have a committee of the whole meeting at the end of August. So we should know sort of what we're going to do with ARPA by then. And then we're going to talk about these projects, prioritize where our priority is, uh, and then come up with that five-year plan. But if these are not ARPA funded, they will be pushed back. Yeah, I'm sorry. In my head, I was thinking Ar I, ARPA for some reason. I was associating with the grant we applied for for Glen Hills. So that's my bad. I, I, I realize that now. But. Ed, you were going to talk? Obviously, I guess you can use ARPA funds for um, camper cabins. And I'm learning something here. <laughs> and I, I guess being those funds are available, it's something like camper cabins to me is something that we can't normally fund very many of them, but it would be nice if being we have this money that you could jump right in because they are a revenue source. <clears throat> you'll get some of that, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll get some of that money back, so. Is there, has there been a way to measure the impact of tourism uh, with from the Loop Trail, have we? I know we're in the very beginning of this, um, but so far, is there any way to measure uh, the impacts? Do, you, do we know yet how uh, is? I see a lot of people there, um, and where I'm going with this is um, bringing the bringing the trail down to Willow River State Park seems to be good 
for the community, probably good for business. And I'm wondering if maybe we should begin to look at that as a, uh, continue to look at that as a priority. And, and maybe for me, that's starting to look like I would almost want to bump that up just because, and it's anecdotal for me because I'd, I'd like to see, if, I'm wondering if we could study it, if we could actually try to look at some way to measure the impact if there's a if there's an economic impact so far to that loop trail try to monetize that but i would think that we should start getting serious about building trails because i think trails are going to be an economic an, an engine of economic development that's gaining speed any other thoughts before we move on It's a good discussion. All right, thank you. Then we'll move into announcements and, oh no, this budgeting staffing request. That's a big one. Ellen, you're on. So um, I wanted to make sure that the Community Development Committee knew that we have submitted two staff, new staff requests for the 2022 budget. Um, an additional parks property manager and an additional land use technician too. During the strategic planning, um, did hear a lot of comments and a lot of feedback about the parks, how people really do love them. They're very well, they're beautiful. I think we have heard a lot of feedback, uh, just anecdotal. I don't have any numbers or any proof, but there is a lot of feedback. People love the loop trail and um, we are working, as you know, with it's on this map, that we already have funding, it's 80% funding in that TAP grant to put in the first leg of a trail, off-road trail within the State Highway 35 right away that would connect eventually all the way up to the Loop Trail. As John mentioned, we would be going after the next leg of grant funding already this coming fall um, for another TAP grant, again, 80% funding. It's a really great way to do this. I guess from my point of view, if there was ARPA money, when you have look at other projects where you aren't even gonna get a full 50% out of the Wisconsin Stewardship Program or other grant sources, and you look at this, this particular set of trails where you can get 80% funding, it's a better bang, in my opinion, for us to try to use ARPA funding for a bigger separate project, like a camper cabins all at once or something like that. Um, that's the way I see it. But, and I also think that this has so much um, potential for great use, uh, connecting Willow River, connecting the future Eckert Blufflands, connecting the Loop Trail, connecting um, St. Croix County's communities of North Hudson, Hudson, and Somerset, that you s just can see that that is gonna happen. I think it's gonna happen. The trail off, the Highway 35 trail. Um, the other projects are a little harder. I think there's just as much heavy use. We have been seeing, we have been almost sold out, uh, almost our campgrounds at Glen Hills almost every weekend in June and July. And um, what hasn't been sold out are the very few that aren't as nice. So for those of you who maybe don't remember, but we have 61 campsites in the peninsula that extends out into the horseshoe shaped Glen Lake at Glen Hills, we have another 10 camp campsites that we um, developed from an area that looks like it should have been a campground but was never opened that way just a few years ago. And those 10 campsites in the, what we would formally call the picnic area with really right next to our brand new shower restroom building, our new brand new pavilion, um, next to our bathing beach have been almost completely sold out every weekend also. And the only area that hasn't been sold out is our old group area, which is actually got still a lot of use, but we have really in recent, in the last seven years, increased the camping out at Glen Hills from 61 really seriously. We've now we're over 81. So um, camping and at a county park is extremely, in a state park is extremely popular does very well. Camping in this county is doing very well. Um, so any kind of camping we can add, I would agree with Judy and with Ed, any kind is going to be really positive. And people, 
are just finding our facilities when we keep improving them. And, in, and we're not talking just putting in a bathroom here or there, you know, a new porta potty and stuff. It's, we're talking about making the facilities significantly better with the nice buildings we've put up. Our new entrance station is gathering a lot of really positive feedback. So um, just we need the additional parks property manager. We've, uh, and we need also looking at where things are at. We need that additional land use technician um, relating to enforcement and other activities um, within the growing number of revenue that Ken pointed out just shows that the workload is that literally was told just last week by our Mike, our, proper, our land use administrator, the staff are under a lot of pressure. You know, we're short staffed, another person left, and they aren't, they're bending, they haven't broken yet, but we're just, we've got to try to have more people. The workload is just keeps it growing. So I wanted you to know that. There's a narrative there. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. No, I'm just uh, emphasizing I for sure I know we need the land use technician. That's uh, we, if we got the laws and regulations and the zoning, we need to keep it enforced. Is there anything we can do to increase the, I hate to say it, but I mean, you're talking about the land use for much higher paying positions. Are we paying too little? And what can we do about that? Well, we, we've had, Ken and I have had some really good discussions about that, and he's given me some great ideas of how to address it, and I will be presenting to him within the next couple of weeks um, some so things along the lines of what he's in suggested we do, trying to create more opportunity for short advancement. Um, for instance, people as they gain knowledge and a great, a gain certifications and um, moving them up short steps. Uh, we hope, we're hopeful that that will start to make a difference. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure Ken can talk to the big picture better than I can as far as whether or not we're paying enough. Because this is a problem that everyone is seeing. We are at our department head meetings, we're talking about everyone's experiencing extreme troubles getting applicants and hiring people, not just my division department, but, and I guess I'd suggest that Ken might have more insights. Yeah, I don't think it's um, about the amount that we pay. I think it's um, how our pay grid system is structured. So it's fine for attracting talent. It's not very good at retaining talent. And so that's where we need to improve our system. And so that's what some of the ideas that we've talked about, um, uh, finding ways to reward the staff that we have when they reach milestones with increases, other than just an annual step increase. Uh, are you looking for support from the committee for these positions? Yeah, I, with these position requests that we have, um, so when we uh, put the budget together this spring, we asked the county board for priorities. So mm -hmm. the priority order one was health insurance, uh, which we will have a 5.6% increase in our health insurance, uh, which is 550,000 for the county. Um, priority number two was uh, increases for the staff uh, to be able to provide a step increase. So that step increase will cost $750,000. Uh, and we should be able to absorb both of those two. I predict we'll have about 1.2 million in new revenues to use. Um, so third was new positions. So we had 15 new position requests come into the county. Um, but I think I've spent all, uh, at most if not all of the money on one and two. So when we get to number three, I'm looking seriously at one, maybe two new positions of those 15 requests. King Solomon. Is there any way of keeping track of when it starts backfiring on us? When we can't fill the positions 
things aren't getting done, taking too long to get done, not being maintained correctly, what's it costing us? Because at some point, it's going to backfire. Yeah. Well, the issue is the structure that the state has us under. So the state used to restrict counties um, by their levy dollar amount. Um, and that changed um, either with Act 10 or just before Act 10. Uh, and it changed over to, uh, it was before Act 10 because it was Doyle that actually did it. They changed to um, the levy limits as a dollar amount. And so our levy rate continues to drop. It's dropped every year for the last five years. But we just can't um, collect enough cash to grow at the same rate that the county is growing. So I know Ellen has these demands. I have these demands across all of the departments. Our population's growing, our service demands are growing, but the um, dollar amounts we have to pay for that growth to match the expense side is just not there. And we have very, very limited revenue options. Right? And we're maximizing them to the fullest extent we currently can. I mean, I'm assuming every county is in this position, and how come this is, is this being conveyed to our state representatives? Yeah. And I mean, are they understanding it? Because this just seems to me like it can't continue. Yeah. So not every county has the same problems we have. Most of them are much worse off. They're actually decreasing staffing. So there are a lot of counties that are cutting positions every year, uh, reducing budgets. We are fortunate enough that we have growth, that we have that 1.2 million that I'm predicting that we'll be able to, you know, keep going with what we have. Other counties are faring worse and they're actually shrinking government units. Well, it's an operational decision and, and uh, I want to be on record as supporting the Community Development Department and uh, I, I encourage you to make the right decisions as you see them. So, good luck. All right, Ellen, do you have anything else? We have some fun announcements we want. Oops. Excuse me. Moving on to announcements. We have a few announcements I wanted to do because some of them are, here we go, are kind of a, um, important, and we'd also like to encourage some of you to attend them, or all of you to attend them. So um, Homestead Parklands, the new entrance building, is completed, uh, beautiful. We have worked with... Um, the former property owners, the Symes, and we have a display inside. I won't get into that, but um, really neat. And we are having a grand opening event August 7th from um, 10 a.m. to 2, 2.30-ish, 3. We will have some uh, treats, a bounce house, uh, little prizes for kids, goldfish crackers, that kind of thing, and uh, some games for them to play and some guests they're um, having some little activities. So, and uh, one of the things will be a scavenger hunt. So, that kind of thing. So, we'd really uh, like to have all of you attend. I wanted to make a point of bringing that up. And on August 14th, uh, we will finally have what's been a delayed um, rededication of the lift bridge. And com with the rededication of the lift bridge and the completion of that restoration, the lit loop trail it was fully open last year. So this is a year later due to COVID, but August 14th, there's going to be a celebration of the completion of the trail and, and the bridge. Um, a lot of the events will be in Stillwater, but there will also be some events up in, on our side. Um, Stillwater is having a, at 10 a.m. They've invited the governors. I understand that the Minnesota governor has committed to be there and a lot of other dignitaries, and hopefully all of you already got a postcard about it. And um, they will be having a ribbon cutting about 11 a.m. because it'll take 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. to do all the speeches, that's what I've been told. And then on the Minnesota side, they and on our side, there'll be vendors, there'll be a um, bike rodeo on our side, there'll be bike safety education on their side, there'll be um, some vendors. We're hoping to get some food trucks on our side and some other um, groups. We've had a couple groups already approach us about having a booth. We will be having a booth at both of these, just the, from ourselves, from St. Craig County Parks, um, letting people know about the, the new plan, draft plan, 
letting them know about the plans for all of our various parks, um, plans for camper cabins, plans for additional camping, plans for um, other improvements, and letting them know, for instance, about uh, one of the things we've most recently completed, and that is the first boardwalk in St. Croix County it will, at the new Orf Overlook. There is how many feet of boardwalk, Dennis? 180? Correct. 180 feet wow. of boardwalk. It's really pretty amazing, and uh, there's a great story there about doing it in coordination with the Conservation Corps, Wisconsin Conservation Corps, mm -hmm. which is a really great program. So, um, we will have displays about that, and plus we'll have the same little activities, a, a similar scavenger hunt, that kind of thing. So again, I really hope all of you can make it. Some other brief announcements about other events. Um, the Towns Association meeting is this Thursday night at 6.30 at the Highway Department. For anybody, Judy likes it when I announce that. Sometimes she goes. Yeah, but I'm not making it this week. That's all right. Um, Farm City Day will also be August 14th. That will double up with our other event. It will be at the Mitchell Family Farm in Erin Prairie Township from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. free lunch, all dairy and agricultural based. Um, there will be water screening clinics. There will be one July 27th. That's this week from 2 to 6, or next week, excuse me, from 2 to 6 p.m. Uh, I don't remember what town that one was in. Uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, but... It, Kinney Connect, okay? And on August 24th, there will be another one from 1 to 5 p.m. in, say a little louder, Brett? New Richmond. New Richmond. So um, two more water screening clinics yet this year. And Clean Sweep, Sweep will be October 8th and 9th at the highway shop here in the town of Hudson. So those are our announcements. All right, since Dan stepped out, I'll um, um, request for any future uh, agenda items. Hearing none, uh, the next meeting will be August 19th at 5 o'clock. We've been through the, uh, the agenda, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.